We have come to our second panel of the day. Of course, the title is Regional Security and Armed Groups. This panel is organized by the National Council on US-Arab Relations, and the discussion will be moderated by the founding president and the CEO, Dr. John Duke Anthony, who currently serves on the United States Department of State Advisory Committee on International Economic Policy and its Subcommittee on Sanctions. For the past 39 years, he has been a consultant and a regular lecturer on the Arabian Peninsula and Gulf for the Department of Defense and State. Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome our moderator, Dr. John Duke Anthony. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, students, uh, youth, uh, aspiring, emerging leaders of the future of a united, prosperous, peaceful, and secure Yemen. It's my great pleasure and honor to be here with you. Um, I have to be honest and say that I have been a visitor to your country, your ancestral homeland, for those of you who've been away for so long and have not been back uh, since the uh, late 1960s. And so from the beginning till now, you uh, uh, stole a piece of my heart, and until now, you've yet to give it back. So I'm in this field in large measure because of you. This is my uh, 59th year of trying to make sense of the Arab region, the Middle East, and the Islamic world. It's like being in a university from which there's no possible uh, graduation. Only on the best of days can one get an incomplete. And when I look out at so many of you and see you are from the northern part of the country, the southern part, and the eastern part of the country, and that you're not giving up, you're not giving in, you're not surrendering, and what more heartening uh, uh, message could this be uh, to the future generations and to the present generation that wants to say enough is enough is enough is enough. Bring us back together. Uh, stop the insecurity, stop the instability, stop the inability to meet one's standard of living, stop the aspects for prospects for a society based on the rule of law, stop the situation where a person cannot leave her or his home without looking over their shoulder to see whether there's someone about to extract revenge or uh, take advantage of them economically or uh, siphon off some of the humanitarian aid that's trying to reach the end users, but is being blocked uh, by the supporters of the Houthis or Ansar Allah or, or other groups. Um, you have survived uh, several uh, crises during my lifetime. The end of the 1940s, when people were about to give up on you, uh, during the 1950s at the high water mark of of Arab nationalism, Arab sisterhood, Arab unity, Arab brotherhood. And then in the uh, rebellion revolution from 1962 to uh, formerly Sabika 1970, uh, but de facto ending in uh, 1967 with the uh, June 1967 Israeli invasion of Egypt, Syria, and Jordan and, and Gaza. Uh, and here you are again, uh, surviving also the 1994 uh, uprising that lasted uh, for several months. Uh, many other people would have written you off, uh, but you're not writing yourself off. I'm an outsider, and I never am unmindful of the fact that I'm an outsider, but I've never written you off, and I'm here to applaud your efforts uh, with the 400,000 uh, Yemenis who uh, living here in the United States, and the thousands more who helped to build America. When Henry Ford talked about $5 a day, and many flocked to Dearborn, uh, uh, Michigan, <laughs> and became the strongholds of the United Arab, uh, United Auto Workers, 
Alabama going to visit them. It was the largest, most powerful unit in the United uh, Auto Workers. And the president, the vice president, the secretary, and the treasury were all Yemenis, Yemeni Americans who had proudly lived and helped to build up this part of America. And Cesar Chavez in uh, California had 4,000 uh, Yemenis uh, working with him in the agricultural uh, movements of the 1970s. Some call them the sojourners. So um, we're here now to, to learn more, to increase our understanding, to uh, obtain information that's hard to come by, and to disabuse ourselves of disinformation and misinformation, and with the information to increase our insight, and with the insight to increase our uh, knowledge, and with our knowledge to increase our understanding, and with all four of these to increase our education, and with these to increase and sharpen our tools, hone them for a, a more critical analysis to cut through the fog of misrepresentation of who you are and what you are not and what you're doing and what you're not doing and the forces that have to bear on your prospects for security and stability and we have three specialists who've devoted a significant part of their career uh, to emphasizing what's needed in Arabia and the Gulf and the Yemeni component uh, of it uh, having to do not just with physical security personal protection but national security of the country as a whole and the intra-regional security having to do with uh, Yemen and its neighbors, which will be touched on here. And further to feel your friends and admirers and some detractors and adversaries and critics as well, further feel in Ar Arabia and the Gulf, Iran, Iraq, the Levantines, the Nile Valley, the Arab North Africa area, the Fertile Crescent and elsewhere. You have the most complicated and most challenging uh, matter of security and stability of any people, any country I know on the planet. And, and yet you're not giving up uh, here. And what it will take to bring about this, not just personal security uh, that I mentioned, not to duck revenge, not to dodge ideological extremism, not to dodge the narrow-mindedness of this or that, political group or this social group or this particular tribe, Hashid, Bakil, or what have, or what have you, not to uh, be uh, uh, waylaid by separatist movements in the South, necessarily, or even in the East, in the Hadramaut, uh, um, uh, Makala, and Sayun, and Tarim, and Shibam, and elsewhere. Uh, you have quite a rich culture, and it's dynamic. It's you who took Islam to South Asia, into Southeast Asia, into Malaysia, into Indonesia. Fifteen years ago, uh, the uh, governor of Jakarta, the foreign minister of Indonesia, the minister of education, minister of interior, were all of Yemeni ancestry there. So uh, you've had an influence and, and impact far beyond your shores. And people want to see it continue. But it cannot continue uh, responsibly, effectively, successfully without security and stability. You can get, not get much more elemental than security. Uh, without being secure, you can't plan. Without being secure, you can't predict. Without being secure, you can't anticipate. Without being secure, you cannot prepare. And if you cannot do these four things, you're not going to be stable. Stable in a sustained way. And without being secure and stable, who the hell is going to invest in you? Who's going to take a risk? Who's going to join forces with you and put their lives on the line? Uh, these are tough questions, and the answers are more tough and elusive still. But there's an economic component to this, and there's an intra-regional neighborly component to this. And we will start with uh, Abdul Rahman al Irian from a distinguished uh, Yemeni family that I've known for a long time. And one of the greats of Yemen was an individual who lovingly people refer to sometimes as the brain, as Abdul Karim al, -Al Iriani. Uh, the most countries would be uh, benefited if they had someone like him. 
So Yemen, you're not bereft of, uh, of leaders. You're not bereft of blemish. None of us are uh, there. But what we need are, are states people, states women, states men. And you have them amongst yourselves as well. Perhaps one or more sitting here in this audience. But we'll begin with the economic component of this with uh, uh, Abdul Rahman Al Iriani. And then we will go to uh, David DeRoche and uh, Giorgio Calfiero in that order. Please join me in welcoming Abdul Rahman Al Iriani. See, I carry this around with me to show you how close I am to Yemen and how close I want Yemen to be with me. Thank you very much, Dr. Anthony. It's such a, you know, it's, it's a... Uh, it's such a pleasure to be here, and I'd like to con congratulate the Washington, Washington Center for Yemeni Studies for organizing uh, today's event. Uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful contribution that uh, Yemenis could, could do, is, is to take or to take ownership of uh, uh, Yemen's, uh, any discussion on Yemen here in Washington, D.C., and to see this event being organized by Yemenis, and especially Yemeni youth, is, is really a refresher. Um, it's always a pleasure as well to share the stage with uh, Dave and Giorgio. I've, I've known them for a while, and uh, they're great, wonderful friends of Yemen as well. Um, so my background is mostly in economic development, but I, you know, our um, panel is, is on regional security and armed uh, groups. And so um, we'll be touching on, on this subject as well and, and try to infuse it with some economic talking points. Uh, but for the sake of time, I'm just going to do this. I'm going to start a timer and begin, and begin with the obvious. That's us as Yemenis, we're, we're glad that, we, that Yemen is experiencing a truce. It's an imperfect truce, it's fragile. Um, but we're confident enough to say that the worst aspect of this war, the greater war in this conflict has practically come to an end. Um, Cross-border fighting, aerial bombardments, I mean, these are the sorts of um, devastations that are very difficult to reverse and very difficult to, to um, essentially to, to fix, um, but the, the most important aspects of this fragile um, cease, uh, fragile truce is uh, to build it, to develop it, to expand it and extend it in order for it to become a durable ceasefire. Uh, and in that sort of environment where we could have a, a sustainable peace process, uh, a sustainable dialogue among all these, um, um, you know, com competing factors, uh, competing factions. And so, um, you know, let's, let's begin first by defining uh, armed groups. Um, you know, initially at the beginning of this conflict, um, uh, you have these various armed groups that we'd label simply armed groups, militias, um, uh, simple terminologies that were adopted. Uh, for instance, the Houthis at the beginning of this war uh, and, and since now, I mean, they've kind of been able to integrate themselves into Yemen's a uh, northern uh, bureaucracy. Uh, they've integrated their forces into Yemen's northern military bases. Um, they have now uh, bureaucrats. Uh, they've embedded de themselves into most of Yemen's, northern Yemen's um, sector and infused it with their ideology. So these are no longer the simple militias that we're dealing with. They, are, um, they have kind of used and invested the past few years in, in kind of... Uh, cementing their presence in the regions where, where they control. And same thing happens in areas outside of uh, Houthi control. Um, for instance, the Southern Transitional Council, they have invested and, and um, you know, um, promoted their presence in the South. Um, they have now regional alliances. Um, and then, um, and, and of course, they are no longer this simple um, group or militia. So they, these are two, for instance, main players that are here to stay and, and for instance, uh, the inclusion of the SDC into Yemen's Presidential Leadership Council is the right step, essentially. Um, this is giving them um, the, uh, the presence needed you know, for accountability and ownership. So the reason why I'm, I'm revisiting the definition of these terminologies is that we need to set the, the bar uh, high for these uh, new entrants into Yemen's political landscape. I mean, in the, in the past, and even, even until now, it's, it, so we're essentially uh, setting the bar high for the Yemeni government while we set the bar low for, for these newly uh, entrants into Yemen's uh, political landscape. And so it's really important that we uh, uh, approach um, these new realities um, with, with conviction that uh, 
we we can only resolve these uh, current issues by dialogue and and by having a safe space for for everyone to come in and uh, speak and resolve their their uh, problems and, and differences. Um, as you are all Yemenis and most of the attendees here, um, you very well know that the monopoly over violence in Yemen has never been really with the central government. It's been with uh, with groups, with uh, tribes, uh, and with these various um, um, social um, groups that, that essentially were able to wield force and wield kind of influence over the government. So um, it's really important to understand that Yemen is a plural country, a plural state, um, and, and dialogue is the only way uh, forward. Um, so, um, you know, if, if you look at Yemen's history, and when I say monopoly over violence has never really rested with the Yemen central government, I mean, we could go all the way back to the 6th century when, when Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, um, sent just a message to the Yemenis in order for them to kind of accept uh, his message. And they, they readily accepted it they, without really going into any sort of conflicts because they realized at that point and during that time, one of the factors was that you had a regional conflict happening at that time, which was between the Sasanians and, and the Byzantines and the Romans up in the north. So the Yemenis back then, the, the wisdom was there for them not, not to be you know, caught in the crossfire. And so today, we're, we're, we're Yemen is experiencing the same thing. Uh, there is an ongoing, um, a really a bigger battle um, in Ukraine and Russia that could actually um, attract um, a direct confrontation with the United States. And, and we do not want to be in the crossfire. I mean, we've seen a Houthi delegation traveling all the way to Russia and, and the Iranians are involved in some sort of dialogue. And, and then you have the other side as well. So we don't, yeah, so it's, it's, it's in Yemen's, um, uh, you know, interests uh, all parties to kind of uh, promote the current truce, extend the current truce, and and find a um, you know a mechanism to resolve these differences. It's not going to be perfect, but uh, it's definitely a start. Um, due to the fragmentation that is happening on the ground, you know, you have Houthi-controlled areas and uh, and government of Yemen and and other uh, and and their loyalist uh, control of other areas so you have that fragmentation that, that geographic fragmentation that unfortunately hinders our ability to have any sort of uh, national strategies when it comes to security economic development um and so we have to be realistic that um that we we should not be waiting for um a national strategy or a, or to have a peace dialogue in order to implement a national strategy we could work with whatever we have on the ground so for instance um, the government of Yemen, um, of course, now the, it's, it's more of a, like a coalition of the presidential leadership council, should be provided with the adequate support uh, in order for them to provide um, basic services, essential services in the areas they control. Uh, we need to provide the Yemenis a, a, a stark example of what it is um, that ruling with consensus, with democracy, could present uh, the, the population. So one of the most important elements of a healthy social contract between um, the government and, and the people being governed is the ability of the government to provide essential services. And, and this is the reason why I feel, as an economic development specialist, um, is that there is room for um, the regional, uh, new regional countries and, uh, of course, allies of the government of Yemen to provide the Yemeni government with the adequate resources uh, to support it with, re, re, um, to, 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 to help it with um, having adequate essential services to the local populations outside of the, gov uh, of the Houthi controlled areas, because this is where they can essentially operate. Um, and, and to provide the Yemeni people with example of how, um, you know, of, of what it is like to, to live under these circumstances. Now, the Houthis, unfortunately, over the past um, few years, especially over the past uh, year, They've kind of expressed uh, their, they've, they've stated it uh, in their communications and their actions. Uh, you know, we've seen military parades, we've seen this display of power, um, that they're not really interested in, in power sharing um, and equitable power, power sharing with their opponents. So we're left with a, with a governance structure in the north that is uh, exclusionary, unfortunately. Um, but as you know, and, and you are all Yemenis, you know that this is untenable. You know, it's just a question of time until we hear more of, uh, of these uh, infighting that is happening in, in north of Yemen, uh, tribal friction. Um, and so essentially uh, with peace, and if we ensure that we extend the truce, 
there will be a, a, a moment where, where the Houthis, uh, and even if they, they are currently reluctant of coming to us, some form of a power sharing agreement or you know, a democratic kind of uh, process, they'll come to a conclusion uh, that they have really no choice. Um, and so it is really vital that we um, invest the current time with, uh, um, with, with promoting you know, st stability factors and help with, as, of course, um, um, promote uh, actors of, of recovery and reconstruction. When I say agents, I mean agents with, of recovery and reconstruction. I mean, we, we as Yemenis, we need to identify um, people and organizations on the ground. They don't have necessarily to be government organizations, but there are organizations and figurehead that are capable to act as, um, as, as ambassadors of, of peace and, and, of course, as uh, agents of change and recovery when it comes to promoting um, economic um, development projects. And as you know, as a diaspora community, uh, one of the biggest um, you know, wealth that we have as Yemenis are, are you as diaspora. We, especially here in the United States, there are a number of Yemeni-led organizations that have been um, really helpful with channeling aid and assistance and, uh, and all that uh, important assistance that Yemenis need, need to, to get. So let me end my talking points uh, here because I, um, I look forward to having a more of a kind of a discussion style with the other panelists and uh, I'll give back the mic to Dr. Anthony. So again, thank you very much for inviting me and I, I look forward to carrying this conversation. Thank you. We next will hear from Colonel uh, David DeRoche with the uh, Near East uh, Center for Strategic Studies at the uh, National Defense uh, University. He's also a National Council on U.S. Arab Relations Fellow in Security Studies. He's a prolific writer, prolific speaker. You're, you're in for a treat, uh, David DeRoche. Thank you, sir. Thank you to everybody, to the organizers for having me. Um, and uh, I, I know that a lot of you have uh, important things to do running a country in exile is difficult, but I want to acknowledge that we have a group of uh, the future that are very bright NISA interns, if you just raise your hand there, um, that came with me, interns from my institute. Uh, can we put my slides up, please? I always have to um, start by saying I don't speak for the U.S. government. Um, I woke up this morning thinking about a beautiful land, land with a strong culture known throughout the world that unfortunately has failed to reach its full potential. Uh, generations of corrupt, self-interested, incompetent, or factionally driven leadership uh, has resulted in this land of great promise, uh, not having the basics of civilization like functioning transportation, water, reliable electricity. Uh, then you have uh, untold numbers of people who are unhoused because of various government failures uh, and the threat of random violence. But then, as I put on my shoes, I said, they don't want to hear about Los Angeles today. They want to talk about Yemen. And uh, realizing that everybody in this audience knows more about Yemen than I do, I've decided instead to talk about developments in warfare that will impact Yemen and Yemen and its future. So this is my contact information. And if you want to get the kind of documents I do on this, just follow me on Twitter there. And once again, I don't speak for the US government. So the first thing we have to look at is recognize that this is indeed uh, elements of a proxy war with Iran. Iran did not create the situation with Yemen. Iran did not create the Houthis. Um, the Houthis are very different from, say, the militias in Iraq. Uh, but Iran is capitalizing off of it. So the way that Iran fights, their regional strategy is, first off, they don't seek to control everything. They just seek to disrupt the uh, dominant, the would-be dominant power. And that's much cheaper and easier to do. Uh, I wrote a book on it. You can see it here. Um, the, it's actually available in Arabic. I had a help with translation from Miss Asma there, who writes better Arabic than just about anybody I know. Uh, Iran operates through proxy attacks. You know this. They seek to disrupt shipping and other commerce to impose costs on their adversary. They do take hostages, and I would argue that a significant amount of the Yemeni hostages indeed, or the Yemeni population is indeed being held hostage uh, by Iran in their goals. 
the primary way that they seek to um, project military power, though, is through ballistic missiles rather than uh, conventional aircraft. And um, the primary ballistic missile they're using right now are along the bottom, about five in the Zulfigar, uh, and the Fatah uh, 110 and 313. These are variants of Scud missiles. The Qiam-1, which you see about eight in, that's the missile that is used primarily for uh, deep attacks into Saudi Arabia. Uh, this is me with the remnants of one of these Qiyam missiles, which was fired at Riyadh International Airport in 2017. One of the best days of my life. I got to go through all the components of it, take it apart, play with it. And the Iranians, uh, you know, the Houthis say, oh, we built this ourselves. But, you know, you're, Yeme you're Yemenis, you know the state of Yemeni manufacturing. And, uh, you know, the industrial base would probably produce refrigerators before missiles. Um, at the moment, it doesn't do either. Uh, and the components are stamped quite proudly with uh, Iranian factory origins. They're easy to trace, and the UN panel of experts has agreed to me. So on the right, that picture is of the Qiyam missile at an Iranian military parade, and I put the flag in there in case anybody needed reminding of that. And in the left is the Burkhan II, which the Houthis still insist is a wholly domestically developed. It's, it's the same missile with paint job. Um, and this allows them to get people's attention. Uh, it's disruptive. You can't conquer somebody with missile strikes alone, but you can disrupt disrupt legitimate commerce, which is what countries like Saudi Arabia and the UAE are trying to do. They're trying to take place as leaders of global commerce. The Zulfigar missile is of extreme concern because it is both hyper accurate, uh, it has a long enough range to strike most targets within Yemen and Saudi Arabia south of uh, Tabuk, uh, and it also um, has a very high degree of accuracy and a solid fuel rocket. And I'll talk about that in, in terms that hopefully will allow you when you go and have conversations at dinner or coffee, you can pose as a military expert. It's not that hard to do. I've made a career out of it. So I'm gonna give you a couple of, of hints here. So the first consideration is range. And the circle that I, I'm sorry that the map doesn't show up, but basically this, you can move the circles here. This shows Iran's borders in the range. The one that's of concern is the red one, three circles in, that's the Zulfigar. This is again a domestically improved uh, version based on the Scud missile, which is ubiquitous in the former Soviet Union. Indeed, Yemen had its own Scud um, uh, uh, arsenal uh, under Ali Abdullah Saleh. Uh, but Iran has uh, improved it. They've uh, particularly put new electronics into it and increased it. And that range makes it significant. Um, the next consideration, and this is one that doesn't really show up well, but it's accuracy. Um, what I want to do is explain to you a concept called circular error probability, or CEP. If you really want to impress people with your knowledge, just say, well, the CEP of this missile. And people will either say, aha, or they'll pretend to understand what you're talking about. But basically, the circle there is, uh, you see the two X's. If you fire two missiles at a target that's in the center of the circle, the CEP is the circle that half the missiles will fall within that target. So during World War II, the CEP for US bombing on German cities was about a mile and a half. Uh, in 2003, the CEP for the Shahab missile, which was basically a Scud, an Iranian Scud missile with a, a paint job or sometimes with a different body, was about three kilometers. But what we've seen since 2020 is the CEP is either 100 meters or possibly as tight as 10 meters for the missiles that were fired at El Assad Air Base in Iraq. So Iran has produced, by using uh, the guts that come in your cell phone, the increase in microelectronics, uh, missiles that are accurate enough to hit within 10 to 100 meters of a target 50% of the time. And that is militarily extremely significant because the more accurate you are, the smaller the charge you have to have in your missile. Um, this, is, this is revolutionary, and it's not just unique to Iran. This technology is out there, so even non-state actors, it is possible within five to 10 years that groups like the Houthis could produce this on their own. Uh, 
The next increase I want to talk about is the shift from liquid fueled rockets on your left to solid fueled rockets on your right. Uh, the, the main impact of this is that it's harder to track a solid fueled rocket because you don't have to fuel it. If you have liquid fuel in a rocket tank, you have to remove it after a period of time or else you'll get corrosion. So that means that you can see you'll either the missiles will be degraded because of that corrosion. This is what happened with most of the missile stock that the Ali Abdullah Sulla regime had. Uh, the missiles were just no good. When the um, uh, Saudi ship Medina was hit by a boat, uh, the warhead in that was actually taken off of a Russian anti-ship missile whose propellant had corroded because of stalling, st storing solid fuel in that. So with a rocket, solid fueled rocket, uh, basically you can store this indefinitely and you can move the missile around and you don't have to have a fueling truck follow the missile. So it's much easier to conceal. And we know from open source data, because I only look at open source data, uh, that uh, Iran has exported the ability to make solid fuel uh, rocket motors to Lebanese Hezbollah, which means that it's logical to assume that they have exported it to the Houthis as well. So they will now have the ability to produce solid fuel rockets, which means greater reliability, less chance of failure, and uh, harder to find. Of course, everybody's talking about drones. This is a drone that was recovered on the battlefield in Yemen by the UAE forces. And the point I want to make here is you see the engine at the back. That's a model airplane engine, readily available. Uh, the electronic guidance in the front are commercially available off Alibaba Express or whatever you want. And the body is pretty much just fiberglass. So if you can make a surfboard, you can make a drone body. And what we're finding, you know, 20 years ago, only the United States and Israel had armed drones. Now it is within the regime of a, it is within the capability of a teenager with access to the internet in the West. And so this idea that drones are some sort of magic weapon that come and change the battlefield, everybody has access to drones. Uh, narcotics organizations in Mexico are attacking Mexican security forces with drones. So we got to get used to this. Everybody's going to have this. And it is no longer necessary for entire drones to be shipped from Iran to the Houthis. They have the capability to build it themselves today. This is the uh, current uh, Iran drone du jour, which has been exported to the Russians for use in the battlefield in Ukraine. It was used in the Abcake refinery attack on the storage spheres. It's basically a delta wing drone with fiberglass body uh, and a model airplane weapon. And you can read the specs on it in the UN panel of experts reports. It's mostly Western technology, which was moved through multiple countries and then found its way to Iran and eventually onto the battlefield. And we're also finding it now on the battlefield in Ukraine. Um, of course, the range of drone strikes is impressive, and this does have an effect on the military situation in Iran. So when the Giants Brigade uh, was on the verge of resolving the years-long stalemate on the Marab front, what we saw were uh, drone and ballistic missile attacks launched on Abu Dhabi, which sought to restore uh, some sort of ease there. And that capability is within their range. And uh, if not now, in the very near future, it will be within the ability of the Houthis and other actors in Yemen without the assistance of any outside country. The, the top picture is, of course, a Houthi weapon display uh, of a uh, guided missile, which is the Sumar, based on the Russian KH-55. And again, the UN panel of experts has documented how the various components of this are produced in the West and then smuggled, usually through third country vendors in China, onward to Iran and on uh, to Yemen. I don't think this is within the range of them to do this. And then the bottom shows both the Shahid-136 drone used in the attacks on um, Abcake and extensively within Yemen, and then behind it, the Burkhan missile, which is, of course, the KM2. So this capability is here. A group that, you know, 50 years ago would have been confined to one province in Yemen now has a regional strategic reach, and that capability transforms the nature of warfare in Yemen and complicates it. Now let me go back to old truths. We've talked about new developments in warfare. I want to talk about old developments in warfare. And that is, if you want to control a land, uh, you can fly over it indefinitely. You can bomb it from the air until you make the rubble bounce. But at the end of the day, you must conquer it as the Roman legions did with soldiers on the ground interacting with the population. The quote is from T.R. Fehrenbach in the book, This Kind of War, uh, which I recommend everybody read. Uh, and the bottom line is, while you have technically overwhelming 
overwhelming um, support for the coalition. And while the Houthis are indeed a minority who have um, achieved power through a coup with Ali Abdullah Sulla and who represent only a fraction of Yemen's government and who do not have a democratic mandate, um, the efforts to dislodge them have failed, I would argue, because um, the uh, effort on the ground to displace them, as compared with dropping munitions from a great height, has not been wholehearted. And again, I will point to the success of the Giants Brigade and the success of the uh, 2019 summer offensive along the Red Sea coast, uh, led by the Operation Sword, uh, where when you did have well-trained, motivated forces, uh, military progress was relatively rapid. But if you have mercenaries or troops who are not vested in fighting, then what you get are static battlefields. And we see the same thing now with the Ukrainian uh, success against a much larger, much better equipped Russian force. This is a, a truth of warfare. At the end of the day, a motivated soldiery is the best weapon, not high technology, not a missile, not a drone. Uh, and of course, the philosophy of trying to control land from the air. It works as a salesmanship technique. It's good for selling air missiles, bombs, but you know, NATO tried it in Kosovo and did not get a capitulation until they threatened a land invasion, and I'd argue that we have seen the same in Yemen. And so with that, I will again uh, ask you if you're interested in this to follow me on Twitter. Uh, that's my email if you want my slides, and uh, I will welcome your most difficult questions, although I have to warn you that if the question's really hard, I will cry. Thank you. Thank you, Dave DeRoche. Now, before I wrap up, uh, speaker, before a few questions, Giorgio Calfiotto, who's the founding guiding visionary light of Gulf State uh, Analytics. He's a prolific writer and an analyst and uh, follows these issues in terms of the challenges, in terms of the trends, in terms of the implication, uh, indications, and the implications of these uh, for policies for relationships, uh, for the dynamics within the region, and um, particularly uh, with regard to Yemen's neighbors, not just Saudi Arabia, not just Oman, but those further afield in the GCC and the Gulf, more broadly speaking. Giorgio Cafiero. Thank you very much. It's really an honor to be with all of you today. Um, I'm going to speak a little bit about the foreign policy of the Sultanate of Oman in relation to the crises in Yemen. As all of you know, Oman uh, has a very unique foreign policy. It has a foreign policy which uh, is considered to be very pragmatic, very balanced. Historically, the Sultanate has had special relationships with Western countries, namely the United Kingdom, the United States, but also uh, we should note that Oman really has um, basically a friends of all foreign policy, uh, east, west, north, south. Muscat is very close to uh, global powers outside of the west, such as China and Russia. And despite being a founding member of the GCC, Oman also maintains a cordial and warm relationship with Iran. Um, throughout the recent decades, um, Oman has played a balancing role on the Arabian Peninsula, choosing to generally stay out of regional and international conflicts and use its neutrality to help uh, different state and non-state actors engage each other uh, via Oman, uh, which has established itself really as a neutral ground for different parties to have talks in after the um, Iran-Iraq war erupted in the 1980s. Oman was the one GCC state that uh, really maintained neutrality throughout that conflict. And some of the ceasefire negotiations between Tehran and Baghdad took place in Muscat. And um, it makes sense that throughout the Qatar crisis, for example, Oman never cut off relations with Doha, and there have been many cases of Oman asserting its independence and choosing to uh, stay out of disputes. 
and the war in Yemen has certainly been a case in point. Back in March 2015, Oman was the one GCC state that did not join the Saudi-led military coalition. Uh, from Muscat's perspective, the Saudi-led military coalition and its agenda against the Houthi rebels was quite uh, problematic. Oman was rather skeptical about the potential for the Saudi-led military coalition to succeed. And sharing a 187-mile border with Yemen, the Omanis were very concerned about the ways in which the crises in Yemen would have potential to spill into Oman. Um, Despite these challenges, the Omanis, to their credit, have been able to respond to the conflicts in Yemen in ways that further confirm uh, the uh, ability of Muscat to play a very constructive uh, mediating role as a facilitator, helping uh, different actors uh, that are Yemeni and also non-Yemeni actors involved in the war try to find some common ground. Um, in general, the way in which the Sultanate has responded to the crises in Yemen is entirely consistent with Oman's principles, which are firmly rooted in a belief that states should respect the sovereignty of other states and conduct a foreign policy based on non-interference. Um, I think earlier on in the conflict, there were some perceptions in some GCC states that perhaps Oman was a little bit of a weak link in terms of um, Gulf Arab efforts to unify against the Houthi rebels. There may have been some suspicions about Oman's relationship with Iran, but over the years, uh, the Saudis, for example, have come to see the benefits of being able to work with Oman in relation to the crises in Yemen and also the United States and other countries have benefited in so many ways from Oman's unique uh, role in relation to Yemen. Uh, there have been cases of Saudi prisoners of war being able to be freed from Yemen thanks to Omani efforts. Um, hundreds of Western diplomats were able to exit Yemen safely thanks to um, services provided by Muscat. Um, and this brings me to the humanitarian dimensions of Oman's uh, role in Yemen. Um, the uh, human suffering in Yemen has been a huge concern for the Omanis who have felt that helping their neighbors in Yemen is part of Oman's uh, role and it's part of Oman's responsibility as a responsible actor in the region. Um, dealing with the humanitarian crises in Yemen has come with some real financial burdens that Oman has chosen to bear. Uh, throughout this conflict, there have been dozens of flights carrying wounded Yemenis out of the country, not only into Oman, where they've received treatment, but also to India and Thailand, where they've received treatment. Um, three years ago, there was a center set up in Salala near uh, the Oman Yemeni border where um, Yemenis who were uh, amputees were able to receive uh, prosthetic body parts and many international organizations from um, the UN and other institutions have gone into Yemen via Oman and also set up um, offices in Oman. So again, I really want to stress that Oman has really uh, gone above and beyond to try to help the uh, Yemenis grapple with an extremely uh, catastrophic set of humanitarian crises. Uh, one of the Obviously, the main goal that um, Oman has in relation to Yemen is to see to it that the conflict doesn't spill into Oman. And one of the ways that Oman is doing this is to try to be a uh, driver of stability in Yemen. Oman has always assessed the situation as such that a political solution is necessary and that there cannot be um, some decisive military victory on the part of one actor or another. So really going back to 2015, shortly after the Saudi-led coalition went in, Oman began hosting uh, 
many different sides in the conflict, the Houthis, Saudis, the Americans, uh, for talks in Oman, and that has continued over the years. The Omani officials have also engaged with the Russians and the Iranians for talks regarding Yemen. And until the conflict is solved, I have no doubt that Oman is going to continue investing diplomatic energy into trying to uh, facilitate dialogue and new understandings. This is obviously um, very difficult to do, mindful of the realities on the ground in Yemen. But the Omani view is that these efforts must continue. And Oman has been working very closely with the UN, the US, and Saudi Arabia to try to advance this goal. Um, throughout the conflict, Oman played an important role in terms of uh, facilitating and helping to facilitate all the peace talks that took place in Switzerland, Sweden, and Kuwait City. Um, at this point, however, Oman's view is that extending the ceasefire is absolutely necessary and Muscat believes the international community must do whatever it takes to see to it that next month the truce can be further extended. Uh, there are obviously so many complicated issues on the ground, um, whether we're talking about the salaries, the income management, the roads and ties, but the Omanis think that it will be much easier to address all of those extremely complicated political problems if the truce can be extended, because with the humanitarian suffering uh, decreasing, it makes it easier for the different factions in Yemen to overcome these political hurdles. Uh, it's also important to talk about some of the concerns that Oman has regarding the future of Yemen. Uh, to put it into a little bit of a historic context, Oman has always been in favor of a united Yemen and has always respected the territorial integrity of the Yemeni nation state. Uh, going back to the 1990s during the civil war after uh, the DRY had itself declared independence, aside from Qatar, Oman was the only GCC country which stood by uh, the central government in Yemen and uh, did not support the DRY. And today, uh, the Omani leadership has some concerns about the conduct on the part of certain separatist groups in uh, parts of southern Yemen. Uh, this obviously has serious implications for al Marha, which is directly uh, bordering Oman definitely concerns that the some of the separatist groups are engaging in actions that might undermine the prospects for um, achieving a long-term settlement to the crises in Yemen. And I'll just end by saying that the work that Oman has done uh, in relation to Yemen has required a lot of patience. Um, it's very difficult to try to build common ground. The issues have just gotten more and more complicated as the years have gone by. But I think it is to uh, the Omani's credit that they have invested a lot of capital in efforts to serve as a diplomatic bridge between different groups within Yemen and different countries regionally and internationally that are also involved in the crises in so many different ways. Uh, thank you very much, and I really look forward to your questions. Thank you, uh, Giorgio, <clears throat> and all th uh, three of your uh, presentations, we and the time for questions. I'll put the uh, questions out uh, and then ask uh, for the uh, specialists to respond as they see fit. Um, it looks as though um, some of the uh, desirables of the economic development and the inclusion of civil society, as well as some of the marginalized groups and among the, the youth and, and women. Um, however desirable, however capable they may be, and however ready and, and, and waiting uh, uh, to play a contributive role, or hindered or hampered or harassed uh, by the lack of security, which all three of you have put your, your fingers uh, on. Uh, and it's hard to see or envision how this 
economic uh, component uh, can proceed in the absence of security. It's hard to uh, see how it can proceed uh, when the technology is increasing that enhances people's fear, or at least uh, some people's fear, uh, uh, as to the threat that the Houthis uh, represent, have represented, will likely continue to represent. There was no mention of UN resolution, Security Council Resolution 2116, uh, which was accepted. However, uh, the implementation uh, apparently is impractical and unrealistic because it calls for the uh, dropping of weapons or the dismantling of the weapons that the Houthis have acquired, not just the scuds from the previous regime of Ali Abdullah Saleh, uh, but the ones that uh, Dave DeRoche has uh, focused on and others that are coming by way of Lebanon uh, through the Hezbollah there and through enhanced local production uh, techniques. Uh, if we use the concept of empathy and predict ourselves into the shoe soul situations of the Houthis whose appetite uh, has grown in the eating. In other words, their original uh, grievances of not having enough of the economic power, power that was deemed by themselves to be their share, or not having enough say politically and representationally in the corridors of power in the halls of government. They're, they're, we are far beyond that now in terms of what the Houthis have achieved and the appetite uh, has, has grown in the process. Uh, without uh, effectively dismantling their part of scuttling uh, the prospects uh, because of their weapons, uh, how realistic is it, uh, all three of you, uh, that this uh, can occur? On top of which, there's a st fundamental strategic division and disagreement. Uh, Oman, as Giorgio rightly pointed out, is in favor of engage, 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 engage. Dialogue, 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 dialogue. To a greater degree than any of the other countries in the region, and also to the great frustration of other countries in the region, because there are some of the players, major players, who do not want to engage. They find the ideology of the Houthis repulsive. They find the uh, geopolitical and geostrategic a geomilitary threat that Iran represents is just unacceptable. And uh, you cannot engage with a, uh, a group that seeks to do you in, or as uh, Dave DeRoche puts down, seeks to disrupt you uh, and, and, and make you pay one hell of a high cost uh, while you pay uh, only a, a minimum of cost. So with these kinds of, of questions, uh, on top of which, what has happened to the weapons that the United States uh, worked with with Ali Abdullah Saleh's re regime and the Scuds? How many of these remain? And what is the use, if any, being uh, of that being put? Uh, and the last comment being to just italicize, neonize, capitalize what Giorgio said about Oman. Oman, in uh, October the 15th, 1998, uh, 33 organizations gathered with the National Council on U.S. Air, Air Relations to award the first ever Arab uh, International Peace Award to His Majesty La Yehamu Sultan Qaboos. Harvard, uh, Kennedy Center, uh, all at the Will Willard Center, Willard Hotel, with 18 U.S. Assistant Secretaries of, of Ministries present there. So Oman has played this role in the shadows uh, since the beginning of the uh, Soviet invasion of, of Afghanistan in, the, uh, in December of 1979, straight through to the present. And it's not budging from its position of engaging and engaging. And therefore the question is, how the hell can you really expect to realistically achieve security on the ground if you do not engage all of the stakeholders and approach it with an inclusiveness? A pro, uh, strategy as opposed to an exclusivist strategy on the part of either the Otis or their adversaries and critics. Please respond. Thank you very much, Dr. Anthony. I think I can respond to uh, the, the first part of your question. Well, when it comes to the economy and, and what 
what uh, what groups, what what civil society organizations could could actually do in an, in a situation, in an environment where um, where really the government and these main um, players are really occupied during a state of war. So it, it is true that it is extremely difficult to have any sort of um, a comprehensive or a sustainable economic development program be implemented while you have an ongoing security issue. Um, but what, what I said earlier um, in my initial remarks is that you have what, what's really special about Yemen, we have this amazing social capital. And one of the social capital of Yemen, including of course the diaspora community, are, is, uh, or are the, is our civil society uh, sector. I mean, Yemen has one of the most vibrant civil society uh, sector in the region. And I think they can play, and everyone knows very well, um, that they could uh, undertake uh, a role uh, to fill the gap uh, where, where the government or where you have, uh, it could act a gap to, to organize any sort of uh, efforts or recovery effort, efforts uh, in, in areas where they're ready to receive economic assistance programs. So, well, let me say as well, just very, very quickly, is that the assumptions that we've been using um, at the beginning of this conflict um, when trying to address or trying to anticipate what future Yemen should look like, we've mostly used the National Dialogue Conference and the outcomes of the National Dialogue Conference as a roadmap. Uh, for instance, we've, you know, a lot of discussion has been emphasized on Yemen becoming a federal state and, and that you'll have a central government while you have more independence or more of a decentralized governance style for various regions. But, you know, unfortunately, and, and of course, I'm, I'm pretty sure that many Yemenis understand this, it's extremely difficult to apply many of these uh, outcomes in the National Dialogue Conference, given the lack of trust and the changes in the power dynamics that are, ex already exist. So I don't want to sound like an alarmist, but it is really potentially possible that we see even a further fragmentation, a geographical fragmentation, where we'll see and the involvement and, and the, of, of, of states I don't know how that would look like, but what's really important is that um, Yemenis face uh, live uh, in a safe environment where essential services are provided. Um, if that requires, or uh, you know, if, if that requires, or if, if what needs to happen is have, having a local central government that is um, responsible and takes full ownership, then it is important uh, to kind of uh, find find that sort of uh, uh, facilitation take place. Um, so what, I, what I'm trying to say is this, it's, uh, the, the, the situation remains fragile, uh, but economic recovery and humanitarian stabilization programs can take place and, and should take place and should be promoted by everyone, uh, regardless of uh, any sort of political um, affiliations. Um, and so I'll end it here, and, and maybe Dave, you want to answer yeah. something? Colonel DeRoche or Giorgio? Oh, man. Uh, difficult question. So um, when I look at it from a security point of view, uh, you know, there's two types of engagement. There's cooperative engagement and then there's sort of de-escalatory engagement. So de-escalatory engagement is what we have on the 38th parallel between North Korea and South Korea. Um, I think that uh, given, given the dynamics of the situation where you have a very small group that has control of much more of the origin, much more of the wealth and the territory and the population of the country than any democratic process would give them. Uh, the chances of participatory engagement are small. Uh, they would basically say, "Look, we have all this stuff. Why would we agree to cede this unless they're defeated militarily?" Um, what really complicates the issue is the fact that uh, Ansar Allah increasingly are defining themselves uh, as. Uh, part of the axis of resistance, which is, of course, an Iranian-generated concept and uh, basically means us against everybody else. And the longer the conflict goes on and the greater the Iranian support, what you see is a cleavage between sort of the ruling elite and the general population, which could include members of the Houthis and, or include members of the population who are hostage by Houthi government. That's going to be harder and harder to dislodge them. Um, you know, we've seen the UN uh, uh, panel of experts reports has documented instances of Houthi leadership taking humanitarian supplies and either selling it for their own profit or targeting it to places that they view as more politically loyal in, in doing that. It's hard to see how you can go back on that. So the best you can hope for is a sort of confrontational engagement where you basically say, okay, this area is ours, this area is yours, you don't go here, you don't go there. What complicates that, of course, is the proliferation of these weapons that I just spoke of, where 
when negotiations break down or if, say, um, fuel oil shipments or civil service government salaries aren't paid by the internationally recognized government, then people have the ability to send rockets, missiles into Abu Dhabi, into, into Riyadh. So I'm sorry to be uh, a, a negative person here, but um, I just don't see a cooperative uh, bien pensant solution for this, unfortunately. And on that, sure. Jojo? Be passing? It is, uh, it is difficult to be um, as optimistic as each of us in a heads and hearts wants to be. Um, and a person who doesn't face reality and its implications is a fool. And uh, adding to the irresponsibility, adding to the danger. And when we talk about engage, engage, and trying to make a de-escalatory engagement of the Houthis who have uh, bitten off uh, more than most people can chew or uh, acquired far more than they could have if it was uh, one person, one vote, uh, one, one, one vote, no. Uh, they are a minority within a minority. And as long as they have this escalatory ideology uh, that uh, looks beyond Yemen that no, 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 we're, uh, our time has come. We're on a roll and a run. And uh, we're going to be a regional player whether you like it or not. Not unlike the uh, Hezbollah in, in Lebanon uh, that, that, that dominates, uh, can uh, obstruct, can oppose, can be the obstacle, can be the stumbling block. Uh, this is what you have in, in Yemen. How to find the power that can bring about this security when there is no great power or coalition of powers able and willing effectively to step up to the plate, so to speak, there and take on all of those who are refusing uh, to go the route towards peace as opposed to the route towards dominance. Um, it, it's hard to see a way forward without that. And none of the questions, none of the answers None of the remarks, none of the addresses, none of the responses have focused on that. So until and unless that occurs, you will continue to see uh, a sense of, from an outside of view, hopelessness. Not, thank God, because of the Yemeni people from inside. By any means, a sense of hopelessness. On the contrary, a sense of perseverance, a sense of pers a persistence. And um, look at the Ukrainians. Uh, they would be a, a case in point for uh, inspiration of a smaller power standing up to a greater power or fewer people are taking on the odds of, of a greater number of people and refusing to give up, refusing to surrender, and refusing to give in. They can pretty much more closely, nearly see the light at the end of the tunnel. Why? because they have NATO at their back. They have the world's strongest superpower at their back. They have a steady flow of, of oil in it, uh, I mean, of uh, financial support and weaponry and intelligence capabilities. That is lacking to a comparable degree of effectiveness in Yemen. I mean, how sad it has to be if you pledge as friends of Yemen billions of economic support and coming through Hodeida or Aden, or especially through Hodeiden, where it's being siphoned off, as uh, Dave DeRoche put his fingers on it. Um, so it's not just the siphoning off to one's friends, um, but selling it in the market uh, for revenue and also a question of retention. Uh, you youth amongst the Hotis, you're thinking of giving up and going back home and studying and immigrating abroad. No, 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 here's, um, here's a scholarship for you. Uh, here's a free plane ticket for you. 
Here's free health care for you. Here's an ability for you to put food on the table for your family. How do you arrest that? How do you stop that? I mean, other than physically stopping it. How do you prevent the well-intentioned humanitarian aid from not reaching the end user? Uh, and how embarrassing this is for the humanitarian aid provider to be, so to speak, exposed for having supplied moral material, weaponry, financial support to those who are engaged in extremism and militancy. Uh, any further comment, um, D Dave DeRoche, I've touched, have elaborated a bit on your point. But Giorgio, uh, the GCC uh, constantly looks at this at every heads of state summit. I've been lucky enough to be invited to them all. And I'm the only American I'm aware of it's been an observer of all of Yemen's presidential and parliamentary elections. And so as the Rahman is right, Yemen is not bereft of a vibrant civil society. We're not talking about dozens of civil society groups and leaders and peoples uh, who roll up their sleeves and volunteer to make something peaceful and evolutionary, effective and possible. No, I'm talking about thousands of Yemenis are there who are capable as volunteers. So we're not bereft of the volunteers. Where are the states people? Where are the forceful ones? Dave, you want to add? Um, I've, I've, been, I've been a little too gloomy, but let me... Uh, <laughs> so we have seen some elements of progress uh, when there's effective ground military operations. Um, I don't think anybody really likes that because it's difficult, it's hard, it's bloody. Um, but there is a possibility that um, uh, if the level of corruption and dissatisfaction rises, you know, authoritarian regimes very rarely fall gradually. They, they, they tend to be in power and power and power and then just like um, uh, Hemingway said about bankruptcy, it happens first gradually and then suddenly. Um, and I think that the ability of people like me who look from the outside to predict these is minimal. So um, the key, I think, for people like us, outside observers, is to continue to enunciate the standard, to hold people to the standard, and to not buy into the various fictions. Uh, Ansar Allah calls itself the government of Yemen. Um, so just uh, uh, keeping with those factions of local government, withholding international recognition, and calling out things is about the best we can do right now and then other than that the situation unfortunately is one that's really up to the Yemenis and uh, it's going to be very very difficult. Here's one that's um, perhaps debatable. <clears throat> no civil war has ever ended without military victory. What would it take for one side or the other to achieve military victory? Um, I would contest the, the, the assumption there. Yes there have been civil wars that have ended without uh, military victory. There have been compromises, there have been negotiations, there have been peace talks, there have been extended truces. Um, so if you want to comment on, on that, feel free to do so otherwise. Um, and, and George, do you have any final uh, statement? In past? All right. Uh, please join me in thanking all three of our panelists. <laughs>